All right, we'll start off with our sessions. Uh, so once again, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is our last session of the year. Uh, I think it has been a great year for us with uh, many atypical cases, many learning points. And uh, I thank the experts who have, and the panelists who have joined us throughout the year, especially Dr. Mankar, Dr. Baltazar, Dr. Vijay, and all the regular case contributors. So without further ado, um, we'll start off with our first case. Uh, I encourage the uh, attendees to put in their thoughts in the chats and any comments, suggestions on the cases, and any questions to the presenters can be put in the chat. So we'll start off with the first case. Over to you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, a four-month-old baby. Can you hear me? Yeah. Who parents had a second marriage and is a twin IVF male child. You know, the baby is well. And mother had gone to her parental house for a month. A uh, few days uh, before these, uh, before the child presented to us, and the history was the child had been irritable for a few weeks, and then when they came back, child started to have fever for three days, and then right focal seizure, following which he was admitted. And at the time, uh, child uh, was irritable post tictal. Uh, but normal pupillary reaction, fontanelle was normal, and there was a maybe suspicion left third nerve weakness, which was not there, I think. Uh, that's something I should have removed. His uh, infection markers were normal. His CSF, uh, mostly lymphocytes, 20% neutrophils. He had had three days of oral antibiotics. Uh, and so, so there was nothing clinically. Maybe we were dealing with a febrile infectious illness. Uh, Maybe partially treated meningitis because three days of antibiotic or oral antibiotic he had had. And then we had this MRI. All right. Uh, no external uh, no. skin abnormalities? No skin. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have the MRI three days into the illness. Um, on top, we have flare, uh, T2, and the non contrast T1 sequences. And you can appreciate there are bilateral. Some neural collections, um, mixed density collections. You can see over there on the flare sequences, better appreciated. Again, on the T2 sequences, you have these uh, clear CSF uh, contents over there, but again, you have high point densities. Likely suggest to have hemorrhagic foci, especially along the left convexity. Um, so, bilateral subdural collections are uh, more mixed density on the left side, also in the temporal lobe, you have these two layers over there. The gradient sequences, uh, again, you can appreciate some, possibly some bridging vein thrombosis uh, out there in the frontal lobes or possibly in the parietal lobes out here. And again, the hemorrhagic foci, the blooming foci of the subdural collections, especially on the left convex tree, it's demonstrated out there. Uh, the FARCs also had some degree of subdural hematoma, um, extending from the anterior to posterior aspects. Uh, if you see on the sagittal image, uh, there is also some retrocerebellar uh, hemorrhage, hematoma. Uh, also in, along the tenterum cerebelli. So subdural collections on both sides, some degree of possibly bridging vein thrombosis, again, some small uh, contusions or hemorrhagic foci in the parenchymal regions and the basifrontal region, frontal lobes. Uh, the orbits, I could not appreciate any... Um, yeah, yeah, orbits, I could not appreciate any blooming foci, but yeah, that is not suggest of not a uh, retinal hemorrhage. But yeah, especially uh, on these images, we cannot appreciate anything. On the diffusion sequences, we have again uh, the age of restrictive diffusion in the subcortical cortical regions. Of, out here, you can see the frontal lobes, parietal lobes, along the cingulate uh, regions, also involving the posterior aspects of the corpus callosum, uh, the posterior temporal occipital lobes, again, predominant subcortical particle involvement of so, so retinoxic edema. Post contrast, you have this dural enhancement, uh, some uh, populations in the left, uh, some dural collections, possibly some neomembranes out there. They diffuse uh, dural enhancement and some loculated collections along the left uh, uh, subdural conduces. And then the question was, I think Dr. Vivek wanted to pose was, uh, is this a possibility of a abusive head injury um, or are these related to infection or related changes? Uh, luckily, we have Dr. Mankar, who is one of the uh, experts for non-abusive head injury. So I'll open the case uh, directly to him if you want to have any comments. There were no intracranial tortuosities, so main case was likely it's likely. The question was, is it uh, infection related changes or is it non abusive head injury? His coagulation was normal, his fibrinogen yeah. was normal and uh, factor 13 was. 
I know a spine was done, I think. Uh, we did a skeletal survey, which okay. was normal. And uh, his uh, uh, retina showed two small macular lesions, but they were not sure if they were hemorrhages. And uh, yeah, and he is a normally developing baby at four months. So does it favor, especially, uh, does it favor, uh, because of different ages of lesion, uh, more of a traumatic brain injury? Because family, when we asked them, they did say, like, they, it looked like that there has been a trauma. Uh, they were not very overt, but they felt mother might have. That's what father said, because the child was with there for a month, and there have been some issues. So my worry was that I should not miss the infection. So infection, I mean, clinical wise, infection is not very severe. I mean, doesn't doesn't very not very severe, I think. Not after a week. It's just the but fever, which could be due to the blood, uh, blood in the uh, yeah. Fever was there for three days. Yeah, but three days wouldn't explain, I think, uh, such a drastic changes, especially the mixed density uh, subdurals. Uh, the likely hypoxic ischemic changes in the parenchyma on the diffusionary sequences. Um, can they be post -tectal? Can they be due to seizure? The cortical and diffusion restricted lesions? Possibly, yes, but to uh, certain extent. So these can be due to shaking injury, right? <laughs> Don't. Yeah, Anas, I would request you to mute your thing. Yeah. Sorry, so, sorry. And the enhancement uh, in the post contrast will that uh, that's not unusual, right? For no, that's not unusual. Um, right. So yeah, I'll open the Dr. Bijay or Dr. if you want to add any comments or any others. Location. Nihal, you said unusual, not for what? Sorry, I didn't get that. There was so much echoing. Sorry, the post contrast. Um, I think Dr. Vivek is asking, is it unusual for um, uh, non accidental head injury? Or is it just uh, infective related changes, inflammatory related changes? Oh, I, I don't think it is unusual. Um, the top differential would be abusive head trauma for me here. Yeah. We all practice in different environments. Uh, so even if we suspect abuser, we would still screen them for the usuals. But um, I think everything else falls in place. And, you know, the retinal hemorrhages, um, you may not see on the imaging at all. And yeah. you might even miss it on clinical examination if it's delayed by 24 hours. So the skeletal survey would be relevant for sure. But here you have uh, these bridging veins, which are also appearing thrombosed, enlarged. And I think that would be the primary differential of shaken baby syndrome here. Um, I'm not going to call retinal hemorrhages on that, but I think they probably did have something in the eyes at that point in time as well. But uh, as per standard practice, you would be obliged to exclude monkeys, even glutaric aciduria and anything else that you might remotely think would be a differential. If you're thinking partially treated meningitis, then you probably have an active CSF. Why are you thinking that? No, I wasn't thinking. No, no, no. no. Uh, so 25 cells, 20% uh, neutrophils. That's what it was. So four-month age baby. So uh, and three days of oral antibiotic had been given. So uh, that was just a differential, but okay. not something. Yeah. And um, I was the first one. Yeah. And uh, the one episode of shaking might be enough to explain all the mixed densities and mixed intensities you're seeing here. So it does not have to be an acute or chronic situation at all. Right. CT was also done, and it just sort of falls into what is being seen on MRI, the hemorrhages. There yeah. was no, there was no, uh, there was suspicion of a left temporal bone fracture, but when we looked at it hard, it was not there. 
Yeah. The only other thing is uh, differentials of hemorrhagic disease of the newborn in the context of vitamin K deficiency still needs to be excluded. Yeah. Uh, Regulation was normal. Platelets were normal. Fibrinogen normal. Factor 30 normal. So those were normal. Regulation. Yeah. Tricky, right? Because in India, it's the social services side is not going to just kick in automatically and take this kid away from their parents. <laughs> So, so then in the end, so uh, there are two options apparently. Either you inform the police and if family doesn't want, then they sign that they don't want the police to be informed. That's it. That's how it works, at least here in Japan. So they sign. That was the easy way out anyhow. So, right. so we're thinking abusive head injury as well as differential loving rate. Um, Followed by the other mimics uh, over here. Okay. Okay. Go to case two. So, uh, this is a term baby who had uh, uh, asphyxia, but more than that, uh, it was a poor oral intake which led to severe hyponatomic dehydration and renal failure. His prehatinine was really high. And then he was admitted in the hospital. He developed sepsis and thrombocytopenia, the whole package. So, uh, and things started to improve. And three weeks into the illness, while he has been in the hospital, he was improving. But because so much had happened with him prior to discharge, clinically, he was fine. Ultrasound, when they did, there was suspicion there was a bleed in the posterior cortex on both sides. So MRI brain was done. Uh, so this was done more because the child had so much in the last few weeks of admission uh, and prior to discharge. Okay. So, so my query was more about is this just the subacute hematoma or there could be a fungal infection here. The CSF was done after this MRI, which was completely normal. Hmm. Okay. So we have uh, at least two focal lesions out here in the parietal occipital regions, uh, demonstrating restricted diffusion predominantly in the parietal aspects. Also, some foci over here, if you see in the right uh, temporal lobe over there. Um, the posterior foci, I could not appreciate any significant findings. On the T2 sequences, you can see again uh, bilateral uh, these focal lesions with mixed densities, uh, T2 hypointense out, out on the peripheral aspects with uh, mixed density in the internal aspects. Also, some again, you can appreciate the temporal lobe abnormality in some particle particle regions out here. This is a coronal sequence of the same, um, again, with bilateral predominant focal lesions in the parietal lobes. The gradient uh, sequences uh, demonstrate uh, some degree of blooming, especially in the along the peripheral aspects of the lesion. You also have some microhemorrhagic foci in the temporal lobe out here, the pedicillian region out there, and also in the right cerebellum. Um, so multifocal abnormalities, um, possibly the deep penetrative veins also slightly more prominent, uh, maybe some degree of stasis, but yeah. Um, so predominant focal lesions in the posterior aspects. This is a non-contrast uh, T1 sequence. And again, you can appreciate that there is a peripheral T1 hyperintensity with uh, iso intensities to mixed density and intensities in the central regions. So multifocal lesions are the large, the two one in the parietal lobes are the largest. Um, I don't I don't think we have a contrast with the right of the way. Yeah, we didn't have a contrast. So okay. That's not good. So, yeah, so when we when the child came back and I saw the MRI, uh, you know, in uh, older children, we have so seen those MRIs where we have thought about aspergillus and it's a newborn. Uh, so, so, so CSF is negative, so abscess is rolled out, is that it is bacterial? Because CSF is completely normal, one cell, you know, yeah, but abscess, sometimes you might not have anything in the CSF, but uh, uh, it's just a child who was going home. And a day before we did an MRI just to be sure, just for the prognosis. So it's so difficult to convince them for more. Like getting, because we don't have an MRI in our own hospital, we have to send somewhere. So you have to send again in an ambulance for a contrast MRI. So we thought we'll just do a CSF, which is completely normal. Uh, so should we still pursue? We should do a contrast MRI. We should pursue infection. Should we pursue aspergillus? In, or you think this could be explained by a resolving hematoma? Very peculiar location for the hematomas, only affecting the aspects. I think it's very unlikely to be a solving hematoma. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fungal infection, fungal abscess has to be ruled out. Yeah. I think contrast right. should be done. Yeah. Because there's rain. The veins are not. There's no... Apart from the imaging, what is the other suspicion for fungus here? Uh, so clinically, there is a because he has been in the hospital three weeks, and he had thrombocytopenia in between. He never had culture positivity, but child who has it been here, he has had a stromy course. He could have an, you know, infection could be acquired and it could have localized in the brain. Yeah, but I think thrombocytopenia in itself, it's better to exclude it. But uh, thrombocytopenia might in itself explain all of what we are seeing, right? So you feel that the, the blood, it could all be blood, dissolving blood. It could all be blood, yes. It could all be blood. Right. And I don't know whether giving contrast right now, Nihal, is going to help you in any further ways. Yeah, because it will enhance anyhow, even if it is blood. You know, those uh, margins will enhance, <clears throat> whether it's blood or not. Yeah. But if it is fungal, internal, uh, that uh, 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 the irregular uh, margins also may enhance. So... In the hematoma, it's a pure hematoma that will never happen. So only the margins will remain, the periphery only will remain. So inside, inside the cavity also there will be... Inside answer. the cavity, whatever you are seeing as that uh, diffusion restricted areas, right. that the margins of that internal margins also may enhance, sometimes fungal. But if it enhances, it is not a hematoma. Outside anyway is going to enhance. Yeah. Right. And the diffusion restriction is uh, seen in the subacute stage of hematoma, right? Is that? Up, I think up to the subacute stage. Um, so again, up. the diffusion um, and the blooming, at least uh, the internal portion here is at least showing restricted diffusion, whereas over here it's only the peripheral aspects which is blooming. So I thought if it's bleeding so, in subacute, subacute stage, it should be demonstrating some degree of susceptibility artifacts. No, all hematoma, subacute stage, it should show uniform diffusion mm -hmm. restriction. Here, only the periphery is showing diffusion restriction that is irregular. Mm -hmm. So, if it is, it is bright on T2, I don't know about T1. Um, so, then that is relatively uniformly hyperindense. But that the whole thing is not showing any diffusion restriction. If it were a hematoma in the subacute phase, yeah, it can show yeah, diffusion yeah, restriction. Yeah. Um, but this has also ruptured the cortex, right? You've got some extra axial material around there. It's not just within the brain parenchyma as such. It's not all intraaxial. But either way, I mean, is the child immunocompromised? Uh, are we using the imaging to diagnose fungal here, or is there a threshold for what it might be? So, because uh, fungal in a neonate is very unusual. They get seracia, they get unusual bacteria. Fungal is unusual unless they have a primary driver or, you know, some kind of immune deficiency syndrome going on. Enterobacter, in those pictures, yeah, exactly. Citrobacter, all these things. But, you know, even in these pictures, you don't easily see fungus in these lists easily. No, and if they the are just that's not that's good. Good. But in your case, uh, Nihal, in your case, if you go back to the initial scans, it looks like the cortex may have been ruptured in parts because there might be something extra axially as well. Uh, <coughs> will confuse your picture is what I'm saying. But yeah, we're doing for sure. I think Bijoy is right about all that, uh, but I still don't know how enhancement in itself can help you call this fungus confidently and nothing else. Actually, I was thinking more of the typical ones. Um... Yeah, those might be more relevant. I mean, your side the... factor, for example, if you see, for instance, those... But uh, again, is, is, is imaging, you might as well aspirate it and get it out or do a CSF or blood analysis for particularly these organisms shown here. And in my experience, you know, the CSF does show some things, especially with citrobacters and stuff, because you have no cells. So, <clears throat> so infection, uh, these infections look less like. <clears throat> CSF is completely normal. And you're not okay. worried about leukemia or some kind of infiltrative disorder here, right? Mm, his platelets are normal now. They have resolved. Okay. Yeah. So, Nihal, uh, that confusion which I had, so, so you mentioned the diffusion restriction, obviously that should also show some degree of blooming, which is not there. That's odd. Is that 
that, that I thought was uh, searched for something else, something else other than blood in, over there. She's showing you. Yeah, story. because I agree. That's something which confuses that you've got a plot which is restricted, but there is no blooming in that area. So is that a pus or is that some protein age content or was the question? Yeah. Shitish, what do you have to say on that? Okay, the question here is uh, this area over here internally it is showing restricted diffusion is also over here, but that does not correspond with the blooming foci. Um, yeah. So if, if it was acute bead, subacute bead, it should have been possibly some degree of blooming over there. And also on the T1s, it should have been more, I think, if it, depending on the stage, but yeah. Nihal, if you zoom out the right occipital and right parietal thing, yeah. there is a, still a double ring sign. Do you agree that? I think there is, there is some infection here. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. Dual the, ring sign. No, the diffusion DW was not corresponding, so I thought, other than blood, there is something there. So. Yeah. Can you show, yes, Nihal, can yes. you show that double ring? And no, SW, SW you see on the right side, if you zoom, you can see there is a no, I can't zoom it, but dual yeah. rim. Hyperindents on the uh, hypo, hypo on the outside and hyper on the inside. And again, there is another hyper on the right side. See this? Yes. So this, why should it happen in the hematoma? No, no, no. There is sepsis. I mean, let me rephrase what I said. A lot of the hemorrhage can be explained by the thrombocytopenia. But it's not just these two lesions. They've got other lesions elsewhere. The transmedullary veins are quite congested here, actually. And you can see the extra axial element of that. So you're going to get frank cerebritis when you give your contrast, etc. But I still don't think this is fungal. No, no, we are not saying fungal. I mean, I'm saying it's something more than only hematoma in this question. Yeah, it's it's a clinical call, right? I mean, we know that there are two drivers to this process. Coagulation problems and sepsis, which is most likely bacterial and unusual bacteria. The problem with those unusual bacteria is by the time you image them again, they have larger holes everywhere in the head. So have a low threshold to do some sequences at least. Right. Problem is, what do you do even if it is? Their outcomes are generally pretty bad. I think best would be to first take it out if it's possible because they are superficial, right one. That should be the ideal. Do you have cortical highlighting on that T1 as well, the last picture? Or am I imagining it? It's going up to the cortex, but... Um... Yeah, no, the last one on, you know, the, the, the third on along that, on the, yeah, all that. Um... So it looks all more bacterial, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I thought. But CSA is completely normal, so I was clean. You did it after this MRI. <laughs> One cell. Wait. Even in a newborn, that's surprising. Normally, they at least have 10 to 20. This is nothing. Okay. Um, so I think we, yeah, so maybe I, I'm already giant something going on there. That's what we can do now. Whether it's biogenic, bacterial, fungal, I mean, fungal or bacterial, that possibly is not easy to say on this scan. Right. On any scan, I guess. Okay. All right. If there some of them are superficial enough, can't we do ultrasound guided tapping from any of the uh, this one? Is it possible? Okay. Vivek? Yeah, we can. We have a neurosurgeon also, so uh, we can. I think that might uh, give a specific answer. Yeah. For the right yeah. side of this one, because yeah. Thank you. Right. So this is a uh, two brothers, uh, both sort of similar phenotypy. A uh, twelve-year-old boy who has left spastic hemiplegia, intellectual disability, and came to me because of his left focal seizures. And hemiplegia has been since uh, infancy. And he's a younger brother who is similarly affected. Eight-year-old boy who is hemiplegic. 
intellectual disability and occasional focal seizures. Uh, do you have the video? Uh, this is the older boy. Uh, uh, left side beaker. He is disabled, but not that much. So, uh, but he is like he doesn't perform to the level. Slightly coarse facial features, long nose, thin upper lip, and that's his brother, <clears throat> who sort of looks similar, and again has hemiplegic. So th that one is twelve, and he's eight. And they look so similar. So I do have the MRI of one of them. Question is it progressive hemiparesis uh, from Shreda? No, no, not progressive. Like sort of have been they both have been same for years. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the seizures have started. For the elder one, yes. For, for the one. older one. Okay. And the MRI is of the elder one? Yeah, MRI of the older one. So yeah, right side of is uh, with cortical thinning, uh, volume loss uh, in the right frontal lobe, uh, communicating with the lateral ventricle, which is dilated. Uh, there is some reduction in the white matter volume in the periventricular regions, uh, deep white matter on the right side. Um, the gradient sequences, uh, not sure of the size thickness, but could not appreciate any um, mosaic or classification of lumen foci along the cavity or within the cavity. Corpus callosum is diffusely thinned. I think these are the only images which we had so more encephalic dilatation of the um, yeah this with a uh, communication with the right atrial ventricle and reduced volume of the right uh, atmospheric white matter so given the um, similar phenotype in both the child children possibility of collagen 4 a 1 2 mutations um, I think was to be considered um, especially one of the common phenotypes is for uh, which can which is seen in our case um, so yeah this was the only diagnostic consideration other than that perinatal ischemic abnormalities, but maybe unusual for both the children to have the same uh, phenotypes uh, in an acquired cause. So, yeah, thinking of call 412, and that was the question after it, am I right? Yeah, yeah, it's just which was interesting, so I thought. Right, okay, I'll open the case if for any further comments. No, I don't think there's another differential right here with the two family members affected. The oh. clinical challenge here would be that if the first child comes, you tell that it's a non-recurrent pathology, you can go for another. Uh, this one. Is there any handle in this scan to say this could be something genetic rather than uh, you should investigate further? True, because if this was first child, and you'll just say antenatal perinatal stroke, antenatal stroke, and you'll say it won't occur again. Perinatal so very... Antenatal. Yeah, antenatal. Has poor encephalic dilatation, I mean, cystic communication. They usually have diocese and some other issue of that. Yeah, level. antenatal. Antenatal. It's true. Hmm. But it's, okay. if this is an antenatal stroke, what territory is it following? Hmm. That is, if we are calling this as an arterial ischemic stroke. If it's just an infarct, that's fine. It's both. It's both AC and MCA. That would be yeah again. That would be unusual. Yeah. Mm. Were they twins? The siblings you showed, or no, 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 four years difference. Four years difference. Okay. It will be useful to scan the other one as well, right? Yeah. Right. So, genetics to be done, Dr. Ek, or? Yeah, uh, family has issues, financial, so I, yeah, I will try to get it done. All right. Thank you. Okay, we'll move over to Pune. Um, Krishna Priya, if you're there. Yes, sir. Good evening. 
this is a seven year old child previously well developmentally normal there was history of a bad rda in which he lost his father and following which he was admitted for uh, two weeks a ct uh, was done outside he was admitted outside the ct was showing a uh, strip of STH along the posterior force, uh, left nasal bone fracture was there and extra cavernal soft tissue swelling in the left frontal region. Uh, about a month later, he developed seizures and raised ICT features and was admitted. And uh, three, four days later, he developed uh, dizziness and vomiting and there was a suspicion of food drop. But his sensorium rapidly deteriorated and she, he got intubated and he had developed cent, uh, central DI, uh, but uh, the raised ICT measures were continued and he later recovered. Uh, we did an MRI a little late actually, not initially during the admission because he was not hemodynamically stable uh, and the MRI with MRI is for the discussion. The CT, was it done? CT was done outside. The initial admission was outside. We don't have, um, yeah, only these many images I have, sir. We don't have the other. So CT of December 16th, is that right? Because I saw 14 number as well. Yeah, the first uh, CT is not there. So 16th December. First, yeah, the November one is not there. This is the second CT. All right. Um, okay, we can see extracts hemorrhage out there in the... Uh, Midline in the frontal region, extending into the ventricles, uh, some subarachnoid hemorrhage too, and the cortex is demonstrating uh, edematous pathogenic edematous or edematous changes actually. Um, so the hemorrhage extends up to the fox ribri, better appreciated on the SAG images out here. Um, so these are the only images we have. Uh, no intracranial uh, midline shift or uh, herniations or midline shift at this point. Um, then I think MRI was done two days later. <clears throat> Again, you can appreciate um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, possibly sub PL hemorrhage or extra axial hemorrhage, as you call it, with uh, particle edema, subparticle, subparticle edema, T2, the sequences, flare sequence out there. And the uh, hemorrhage uh, corresponds with the blooming changes on the SWA sequences. Some foci of intraventricular hemorrhage in the occipital horns and some degree of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage in the cilium fissures on both sides. Uh, diffusion sequences on slightly uh, higher up, we have these area restricted diffusion in the left frontal lobe. Corresponding edematous changes on the flare sequences uh, with lower changes on the ADC sequences. So the question, uh, then we, um, angio was done, angio do not appreciate any thrombosis or stenosis. Possibly the hemorrhage is causing some um, mass effect on the anterior subarachnoid on there, over there, but the flow is meant, is uh, going up to the periphery and distal branches. The neck vessels do not demonstrate any of the matties. Uh, so, Krishnapriya, the question was uh, cause of the yes, bleed. Uh, yeah, uh, and the child still has a partial food drop. So, we were wondering if that is due to the compression still, which is there, or is there a infarct because of the compression? Any evidence for that in this? Okay, so I found few papers with uh, subdural hematoma causing the uh, pressure effect resulting in infarcts. But if you think of the imaging as the, the abnormality on the second MRI, a subfile hemorrhage, which are commonly known to have these particle uh, infarct or ischemic changes because of the compression on the bridging veins, that could possibly be an explanation. But I haven't seen subfile hemorrhage in this age group, more in the neonatal age group. Um, no aneurysm per se um, on the angio. So this is the only explanation I could think of. Pressure effect by the bleed causing the uh, pressure, I mean, effect on the particle veins resulting in impact like changes. Is there injury to the uh, the pituitary uh, stock, which explains the central DI here? Because the location of the hemorrhage is quite close to all that. Um, MRI don't have a sag, but here it's possibly going up to the supracellar region. I mean, Sridhar is right, but I think we should be looking out for on MRI, particularly uh, any obvious disruption of the stock. The um, ischemia of the brain associated with the subdural is fine because it causes a micro circulation problem yeah. locally with its pressure effects and all that. So you can get ischemia. That's not a surprise, whether it is subpeel or whatever it might be. 
but uh, quite a sad story. I mean, are we labeling this as diffuse axonal injury then? Uh, the sensorium of the child has gradually improved over the last one month, sir. Uh, now he is responding to questions. He has started walking with support. Uh, if it is a diffuse injury, will he pro uh, will he improve so much? Probably not. I mean, uh, at least on the images here, we are not seeing very eloquent areas which typically go with DAI. But looks like the hit was significant. <laughs> the recovery is there, but slow, isn't it? Children will undergo a lot. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. has been one and a half months. Yeah. yeah, recently, last week only he started walking a little bit. And there are some punctate foci over here in the parenchyma basic frontal region, but I think predominantly it's extra axial hemorrhage. So, yeah, for that we did his coagulation profile also, thinking if there is any derangement, is that why uh, those were all normals? And has the central DI improved in one and a half months? No, sir, he still has hyponatremia and he's on desmopressin. So, I think he's transected his uh, pituitary stop from trauma. Okay. If you see that sagittal uh, CT, you know, it is so close to all that, there would be a direct impact. Should we do any further imaging to look at that? I mean, if you can provide us the MRI side of this. Is yeah. Okay, I'll try to send it. I mean, was it not commented, I guess? On the... It was, no, there was no comment on the pituitary stroke. Uh, I I just looked at the bright spot whether it is there because of the DI, but I thought that it is there. If you see at least now it is. If you see the outline of the hematoma is in the region of the supracellular cellar region. Yeah. Nihal, radiologists it. don't always review that area on him. You know, we don't always mention what happens to the stock and all that. So it'll be a question of going back and looking at it. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't think everything can be explained by an SIADH related to the trauma per se at, you know, at one and a half months, right? Dynamic pituitary function test. Uh, is that a MRI or this? Dr. Rajiv? I think dynamic pituitary function test. I'm not sure if that. Is that a clinical test? Uh, any idea? Um, no, sir. I'll have to look it up. Not sure. I think, yeah, for starters, maybe look at the entire scan in total DMs. Yeah. yeah, sure. But the, the ischemia and hemorrhage is pretty evident. It is causing my pressure effect as and resulting in ischemia to have some extra hemorrhage. So we'll have to look at the pituitary and stop. Maybe you can send in the images or the entire scan. Yeah, yeah I'll. <clears throat> Over to you. Yeah, Krishna, over to you. Yes, uh, so second child here, she is a seven-year-old female with no significant perinatal or family history. She has three healthy siblings, uh, which are all girls. Uh, she had a normal birth weight of three kg and uh, from the six month of age, she uh, was a failure to thrive child. Uh, from Six months to two years, she had a um, she had milestones. She was achieving the milestones, but rather slowly. And she could walk with support by the age of two years with three to four words vocabulary. And from two years of age, there is motor and cognitive regression. Uh, Mommy, uh, so now, uh, yeah. now oh. she has lost ambulation and gradually she has lost sitting and presently she is confined to the bed. There is regression of fine motor as well. Social is prefer, uh, preserved. Language, she has lost the words, but bisyllables are there. On examination, there is no transfer of objects. Unidextrous gasp is there. And um, she has intellectual disability, microcephaly, moderate microcephaly is there. And she has these abnormal eye movements in the video. And she's dysmorphic with a triangular face. She has oromotor dyskinesia and severe wasting, as you can see. And the uh, fundus is normal. Her uh, 
deep tendon reflexes are much exaggerated with a sustained clonus. There is no history of birth trauma. Either has mentioned a uh, paroxysmal tonic up case. Okay, dopamine transmitter deficiency, AADC deficiency. All right. Let's look at the images. <clears throat> okay, I have diffusion and ADC sequences over here. Um, you know, appreciate that there is confluent white matter abnormalities um, in the periventricular deep white matter. Possible cystic foci out here are adjacent to the right frontal horn. Uh, the lateral ventricles are slightly prominent, especially on the frontal aspect. There is some reduction in the white matter volume, especially in the posterior aspect. Some diffusion changes in the brainstem structures. For the majority of them demonstrate um, facilitated diffusion, especially the white matter abnormalities. Um, brainstem, I wasn't sure if it's true restricted diffusion, but you can see here some degree of um, edematous changes in the brainstem and the thalamic regions are there. And the flare sequences better demonstrate the abnormalities, confirmed abnormalities, uh, predominantly in the deep white matter, subcortical white matter, uh, the frontal parietal regions, extending also in the temporal lobes. Basal ganglia abnormalities with atrophic changes uh, and signal changes, cystic changes in the adjacent to the right frontal horn, uh, reduced periventricular white matter volume, uh, brainstem edematous changes, um, again, more on the dorsal aspect. And I could not appreciate any structural abnormalities in terms of malformations, uh, dis particle dysplasias. Sad images of the cysts, multiple cysts, predominantly along the periventricular regions. They do not follow the CSF intensity, just like the um, you can see that the CSF of the ventricle is dark in the society, more hyper intense. Uh, but multiple cystic foci in the uh, periventricular regions, especially on the right side. On contrast to CT scan, and you can see that there is um, again the cystic regions, no calcifications. Um, I'm not sure if it projects out uh, clearly, but you can see the periventricular abnormality is slightly more hyper dense. Um, some uh, rim like hyper density along the periventricular regions. Uh, on the non-contrast CT. The spectroscopy was done in the basal ganglia and the white matter changes did not demonstrate any significant abnormalities or no lactate, significant lactate peak. Um, yeah. And then the, I think, question was, uh, Mr. P.I., was it hypomyelating leukodystrophy, cocaine syndrome, pedicellus, Mosbacher disease, mitochondrial on mutation? Um, I can possibly say that it is none of these, um, especially if you take imaging in consideration. Um, so predominantly a dysmyelinating or demyelinating leukodystrophy with uh, cystic changes, dorsal uh, striatal atrophic changes uh, and brainstem, brainstem hyperintensity changes. Um, not seen in hypermyelinating leukodystrophies, no calcification for cocaine syndrome, not typical for pelizumus bugger, and mitochondrial surfon also, I don't think it fits into surfon mutation. Any uh, further questions, Krishna Priya, regarding the case? Yeah, hi. Sorry to uh, join late. My mobile got discharged. Uh, yeah. Good evening. Actually, the, this child had, uh, uh, like, we are suspecting now a cystic uh, leukoencephalopathy. Yeah. And there was a severe failure to thrive. And uh, major disability is dystonia. She yeah. has very severe oromotor dystonia as well as, uh, in, in fact, she is almost like a log. Very severe dystonia is there. So, uh, how do we fit this together, like cystic encephalopath, uh, leukoencephalopathy with the basal ganglia? That's why we thought of maybe mitochondria. Okay. As far so, as what, I, what are the thoughts? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Um, as far as I reckon, it doesn't fit into mitochondrial assist. So, they are usually don't have more cavitatory changes rather than cystic changes. Um, and there was no, uh, I mean, spectroscopy is not definite, but yeah. Uh, so there should have been some degree of lactate on the MRS. Go back to the pictures, Nihal. Yeah. Okay, this is the main side with the which demonstrates all the findings. Um, So uh, these uh, uh, dark spaces, they are not cavities? No, no, they are cysts. Uh, the yeah, so cystic, uh, that's what uh, we thought, cystic leukoencephalopathy. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, the basal ganglia affection, what what exactly uh, it is, and uh, is it pointing to any particular disorder? Basal ganglia, at, at the moment you are picking up mature scarring, and I think the central tegmental tracts were also involved. So I wouldn't take mitochondrial away from this, Neha. If that is the crux of the question. Nihal, can you show the spectroscopy once more? There is a codeine. Uh, what was the age? I forgot the age. Krishna paid any idea? Seven years, sorry. Seven, eight seven. years, yeah. Seven. So the codeine is elevated for a seven year old. Is that right, Dr. Vijay? Why is it yeah. so hyper dense on the CT in these yeah. areas? Looking at that, I thought then um, is there a possibility of Alexander's or GFAP related disorder? Alexander's did cross my head, you know, with the ventricular garlands and all, but. Uh... Then I saw the unile cases have the cystic abnormalities in them. Uh, she yeah. has a moderate. That. She has a moderate microcephaly. Microcephaly, so yeah. that was, but that CT was. It is quite. I mean, we have not seen many mitochondrial CTs, so we don't know what is standard there, right? Mm -hmm. But these are quite hypodense. These changes, <laughs> unless you guys have seen more CT with mitochondrial disorders. They usually are hypodense, I mean, anything. Yeah. And also that thing along the frontal, uh, what we have called cysts or whatever, the density of that is quite unusual. Yeah, it doesn't point, I mean, at least what cysts we have seen are usually more CSF following in my toes. So I thought maybe, I thought maybe labrun, but there was no calcification. And, um, was there an infection to start with? No, 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 no no. Exactly. I think uh, somebody has put cysts look like trapped ventricles. In a way, they do. That's what we get with infections. And so we thought about that. Any sagittal purpose colossal pictures are there? No, 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 the only ones. Yeah, I was looking, trying to look for the middle blade, but uh, I was provided only with these images. But I think still complex 1 and 3 should be ruled out. Complex 2 is out because spectroscopy, there is no such net. And sulfur is unlikely. So I think in addition to whatever we have discussed, yeah. mitochondrial cannot be entirely ruled out because by right basal ganglia also there are tiny cysts. Mm -hmm. I agree with and that, the brain stem changes also would go with that. Yeah, and the dorsal the meniscal tract that Dr. Manga told. Because so, uh, whatever basic basic uh, metabolic profile we could do was not uh, very conclusive. Of course, in many mitochondria, we may not get high lactate and all those things. So uh, we have actually sent the whole exome and mitochondrial genome. Let's see what we get. And uh, the reason for doing the CT was to look for calcification because initially it, we thought that it's LCC because uh, it was labeled as hypomyelinating initially. So that's right. I mean, here it would stay yeah, that yeah. classification. Yeah. But the only thing that CT periventricular rim was slightly typical, I thought. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, Arti, if you're there. Uh, so, this is the case of a six year old male child who was the third born of non consanguineous marriage. With a background history of neonatal seizures and speech delay, he was admitted with status epilepticus outside and referred on uh, day seven of illness. Uh, prior to referring here, he had seizures basically followed by fever on day four of illness and uh, they were left focal seizures when he was ventilated. He was on four anti-seizure medications and uh, antibiotics were started. And uh, the seizures, actually he was extubated, but seizures continued, so he required a re-ventilation. Outside, they had done a plain MRI, which has been uh, uh, put up in this uh, presentation. And uh, that shows the retrocerebellar cyst. And the seizures continued, so he was referred. And uh, I'd, on arrival to the ER, he had left hemifacial twitching with tonic extensor posturing, and he had papal edema. And uh, bilateral pupils were uh, dilated and reacting. He had a poor GCS and started, and then his uh, um, the ventilation was continued, and he was started on midazolam infusion, and he was continued on the same anti-seizure medications as before. When sodium valproate was given, he had transaminitis, so it was stopped. 
Uh, so we uh, continue to, in the first one, one, 24 hours, we treated it as acute encephalitic syndrome of infective etiology. Uh, along with the anti-seizure medications, we gave meropenem, vanco, and acyclovir. And uh, MRA was also planned. But he was uh, hemodynamically unstable. He had hypotension, was on inotropes. So he was still uh, just undergoing treatment. EEG initially showed a bilateral frontocentral dysfunction with burst suppression. And also later on also showed a severe bihemispheric dysfunction. Next slide. Uh, his encephalopathy was persisting and uh, his MRI was repeated. And that is uh, again put up here. Considered as demyelination and started on pulse steroids. Seizures were controlled. But encephalopathy persisted, and uh, a trial of, uh, I mean, uh, on re -seeing, revisiting the MRI findings, we gave a trial of thiamine at a high dose, 1,500 mg per day, and biotin, following which his encephalopathy had drastically improved. Uh, but uh, he still has a waxing and waning of his uh, uh, GCS, and the seizures are controlled, but he has significant dystonia, spasticity, more on the left side, but hemiparesis on the right side. And uh, currently, he is on uh, anti-seizure medications, cardinal, levetiracetam, and uh, pyridoxine was started outside. And he has been started on biotin, thymine, CoQ, and carnitine, riboflavin as well. And uh, his CSF, I think it's coming in the next slides, is normal. And uh, the relevant past history is he had neonatal seizures and he used to have seizures every, every like three months in infancy. The last seizure was uh, around six months back. And uh, there is a uh, family history. The first, uh, this is a third born child. The first born baby was a girl who had seizures 16 days of life and expired. MRI for discussion. Investigations. The blood investigations, CBC, CRP were normal. Uh, the sodium initially was just, sodium initially was 150. Lactate, ammonia, and pyruvate were normal. And uh, CSF total count, 8 WBCs, 3% neutrophils, 5 remaining as uh, lymphocyte, sorry, 5, 7 to 6 RBCs, and CSF viral and bacterial panel were negative. Sugar protein were in the normal range, and uh, serum MOG is uh, actually awaited. Blood culture showed acinetobacter baumani, and toxo IgM serum negative. Okay. Um, all right. So, I have the initial MRI, um, there's uh, some degree of ventricomegaly out here. Um, the posterior fossa um, extraxial space, especially on the left, uh, convex C is prominent. And that was labeled as retrocerebellosis. Um, no signal abnormalities in the basal ganglia, thalami, uh, particle, subparticle regions, possibly some benign cystic foci or perivascular spaces in the periventricular regions and the deep white matter. But again, flare, uh, yeah, no parenchymal signal changes, uh, maybe some degree of periventricular volume reduction with the ventricomegaly. And the posterior fossa changes predominantly in the extra axial uh, regions. That was the first MRI. Um, on top of on the flare sequences, I'm not sure if there is some edematous changes, but appears slightly bright, especially on the left hemisphere, on the top panel um, on the right side. And then diffusion and ADC sequences. Um, we have areas of restricted diffusion. In the cortical regions and the bilateral hemispheres, the bilateral basal ganglia demonstrates these um, confluent patchy abnormalities. The thalamus also has you know, restricted diffusion. Uh, the midbrain, especially the ventral aspect, the cerebral peduncles, also demonstrate restricted diffusion. So deep brain nuclear abnormalities with particles of particle areas uh, involving the bilateral hemispheres and also brainstem involvement. With uh, cerebellum also has some degree of uh, edematous changes uh, in the bilateral hemispheres. On phase sequences, again, um, changes of um, edematocene in the subparticle particle regions, the bilateral basal ganglia, um, the cerebellum, corresponding change again on a T2 sequences. So, predominant changes in the deep brain nuclei, subparticle particle regions, the brainstem, and the cerebellum, uh, some, some degree of thinning of the corpus callosum. These are the main changes on the follow up scan. Uh, the differentials considered were infective etiology, but given that the child has a long-standing course with neural presentation, possibly unlikely. Uh, biotin thymine, given that the child has uh, responded, especially in terms of encephalopathy. But cerebellar involvement was slightly uh, atypical, especially in the older age group. In the neonatal inf early infantile, biotin thymine can present with cerebellar involvement. Uh, but again, the other phenotypes, such as the Brazilianga involvement, thalamic involvement, subparticle particle involvement, can be seen in biotin thymine disorders. And other abnormalities, um, especially focusing on the basal the ganglia dorsal striatum, 
mitochondrial disorders, um, organic asturias uh, to be kept in mind. The question was, uh, is this biotin thymine responsive to Spangler disease, Paul G mutation, uh, MELAS or HIV lupoencephalopathy? That I open the case for a discussion. There was some deterioration with valproate, I think. Can Paul G is a is it a is Paul G is a good uh, suspicion, especially with the cortical involvement and bilateral thalamic involvement. Mm -hmm. Alpha certain lock is it a pro, is it a possibility? Yes, sir. We have also considered Paul G. We have actually sent genetics now. The child is still in the ICU, and uh, the lactate, ammonia, and pyruvate were normal. We have not done the MR spectroscope. We, had a clinical suspicion of encephalitis bar Adam and uh, the in the MRI. And hypotensive, right? Not hypotensive. Just to rule out unlikely press but... There was no significant hypertension. Epilepsy, uh, partial is or what was that? Sorry, I forgot. The... It was well, uh, at arrival of the ER, he was having left focal twitching. Uh, left focal seizures, but that had got controlled with two medications. And uh, following that, he had only activity on the uh, like elect electrographic seizure. And uh, his clinical seizures had got controlled. Uh, he had some uh, myoclonic jerking of the left shoulder and uh, thing, but he, like epilepsia partialis was not very distal and very focal seizures. So in, uh, we are thinking of differentials as what we have uh, put out mitochondrial, um, biotin thymine, thymine transport deficiencies. So genetic is what we are thinking. Yeah, we have sent genetic. So there's a question of uh, refractive seizures with hypocytokinemia, related epilepsy, also called fires, um, our favorite term in our discussions from Sridhar, um, can have cytoxic edema. Would that explain the long-term history or from the natal presentation now? Uh, Nihal, uh, biotin thymine responsive basic ganglia disease, the cerebellar white matter should involve, no? like a bad wing appearance here, the cerebellar cortex is involved. So yeah, yeah, that was the atypical part of biotin thymine. So, my strong possibility is still a ball G disorder. So, I think you can get back to us with the genetics once you have it. Yes, I'm sure I'll get back once the results are out. Okay, so in the chat also people are favoring all G, CNS, HLH, if fever is still persisting from Shridhar, all right. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to you with an answer, but yeah, primary suspicion is of a mitochondrial disorder. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you all. Okay, Anas, over to you. So she's a, this is about a four and a half year old female child. She's a well child uh, prior to March 2024. Uh, so problem started from March 2020, sorry, March 2023. Uh, started with fevers, uh, fever. Uh, so she had fever trigger seizure in the form of right focal gonic seizures, brief duration. Uh, she recovered from that. And from April to November, she had multiple, um, so she kept on having a sporadic seizures despite uh, having no fever, which was well controlled with medications. But in the past 20 days, uh, the seizure frequency and um, uh, duration kept increasing and involved right hand and face and eyelid on the same side. She was uh, aware during these episodes. There's no behavioral changes, no sleep or other concerns. She was um, admitted initially at a different center and then eventually at our center. Um, uh, so the seizures uh, were um, difficult to control with despite having four to five anti-epileptics. And she also received immunomodulation uh, with IV methylprednisone and IVIG and did not show any improvement. So, uh, oh, the no. seizures. Yeah, the EP, it was a EPC uh, with uh, intact awareness. Okay, another EPC. Okay, all right. But only on the right side, all the seizures were on the right side. So, this child uh, had a previous scan in November. Uh, this is a scan done, on, I think, a couple of weeks back. Um, I have different sequences on top. Um, Cannot appreciate any for signal changes on the diffusion of sequences. Uh, 
uh, coming down on the flare, there is overall reduction in the brain volume. Uh, but if you see the pre the periodontic region, especially the piece under the iris over here, as the strain hyperintensity in sub in the particle regions and with some extension in the subparticle area, you see going down medially and and uh, inferiorly, there is this hyperintensity along the subparticle particle regions. Uh, does not correspond with any uh, diffusion, significant diffusion abnormalities. And rest of the, I cannot appreciate any abnormalities in the rest of the particle regions. Uh, some hyperintensity of the white matter, uh, but again, not very significant. Uh, the corresponding uh, sad sequence out there. Again, you have these abnormality in the B-central gyrus um, and overall reduction in the brain volume, especially involving the corpus callosum, the cerebellum, and the cerebral, cerebral hemispheres on both sides. Then the child had a follow-up only flare sequence, I think, a um, couple of days later. Is that right, Anas? Yeah. Yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, Dr. Gitz, yeah. So then you see that the intensity is uh, slightly reduced in comparison to the initial MRI. It is still persistent, but you can see that the cortex outline is more better appreciated. I would argue that the flare sequence wasn't done, uh, I mean, thin slice flare wasn't done at that period of time, but you can see that there is some reduction in the uh, hyperintensity. But again, on the sad sequence, you can appreciate that the focal abnormality is uh, centered in the periodontic region out here. Then a PET-CT was done, uh, and you can appreciate the multiple areas of hyperperfusion changes in the, in the frontal lobes out there, the basal ganglia, the deep brain nuclei, thalamite, the perisylvian regions, um, also in the brainstem and cerebellum. Uh, I, I, there was also a previous scan in November. Um, I have seen the images, but I'm not, I forgot, I just haven't put it up here. But those edematous changes in the left periodontic region was not present in the scan done, I think, a couple of weeks prior to the one which I've seen. Um, so, multifocal abnormalities on the PET CT, um, and only this focal area of abnormality is, especially what, at least what I could see was on the, um, the second MRI. Based on that, I think the question was, uh, sorry, uh, Anas, if you want to just uh, round off the investigations. So initially, uh, yes, uh, we have which could be amenable to surgical output, but before going for that, we wanted to make sure uh, we're not missing out any polger or any autoimmune. So we have uh, serum and MDA was done, it was negative. Uh, CSF lactate was done, it is normal. Serum lactate was normal. Uh, autoimmune panel has been sent. And whole whole exam with mitochondrial has been sent as well. So EEG picked artifacts over FP2 and F4 with no physiological waveform during the ictal record. Inter uh, ictal record could not be uh, gotten because the child was either like child has complete seizures only, and when uh, so we could not get a ictal record. Whatever brief it was there, it was just uh, no sleep markers were there during the uh, ictal record. Yeah, it was a generalized encephalopathic whatsoever short background we could visualize. Uh, yeah, but uh, we, we couldn't pick up any, I mean, despite of that lesion being very superficial in the superficial cortex, we could not actually pick up uh, any epileptic discharges. Okay. Yeah, then I think we discussed with, uh, after seeing the PET scan, we thought of possibility of apology given that there were multiple areas of uh, PET uptake. Uh, the periodontic sign is supposedly yes. going to be seen in apology, but at least what we are seeing is uh, diffusion is usually positive, but that possibly can be related to the uh, stage of the scan. So our child also had a periodontic uh, abnormalities in the left side, it was slightly hyperintense. Um, on the follow-up scans, you can see that the deep brain nuclei can also be involved, and this is an ASL sequence, which has multiple areas of increased uptake for fusion changes. So given the EPC uh, presentation with um, the, that sign on the MRI and then the PET study, thinking of uh, possibility of a apology related disorder. Is that right, Dr. Nikhil? Uh, yes. So, so the, the serum lactate and blood lactate went... Uh, the serum lactate and blood lactate paired samples are normal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and we have sent autoimmune panel just... I mean, it's not a strong suspicion because uh, bilateral pet changes, uh, that would be very unusual to begin with in Rasmussen's. Majority of the Rasmussen's will be uh, sort of unilateral. They can be bilateral, but majority of them will be unilateral. So autoimmune uh, versus palsy. Palsy is a strong possibility here uh, versus autoimmune. We are trying to rule out just because it is. it could be more treatable. Question of spectroscopy. Um, we did not suspect mitochondrial on the initial scan. Uh, the pet CT was done after the MRI, so I think the mass spectroscopy wasn't done. 
I'll open the case if anyone wants to add in the comments. I think Sridhar has mentioned possibility of uh, Paul G and Rasmussen and Supplytus. Yeah, uh, and uh, Dr. Nihal, just uh, when we were reviewing this, can we also felt that left quadrant is slightly bulkier and has slightly increased signal as compared to the right side? Uh, okay. I mean, if you especially look at the top, I mean, the body of product especially. That's a diffusion on top. Um, no, no, no. As in the sections which involve, I mean, you may not have put it here. It doesn't. Yeah, I think it's Yeah. And the MR was much more in favor of Rasmussen's looking at MR, but then PET uh, deviates that diagnosis to, yeah. Mogad, uh, Yogesh, I don't think. Uh... Yes, she is like quite quite prolonged, eight months. Yeah. So uh, I, I wouldn't consider Mogad probably. All right. Uh, so I think all G is what we are considering. Sure. Dr. Vijay, any comments or any suggestions? Anything to add? Imaging wise to be done. I think I think these are uh, good suggestions and Borgi is again high on the list. Okay. Uh, the other question is: uh, Will we see this sort of unilateral white matter abnormalities if it is Borgi spectrum? Yes, it can come. Okay. It is not that it will be always showing only this. It can produce cortical, subcortical white matter involvement, predominantly occipital okay. and parietal region. Usually yeah. unilateral to start with, but. but it's all yeah, possible with alpha certain locker. Right here, the white matter changes are primarily anterior rather than posterior, it looks like. Yeah, it's all, all. Uh, it is not that uh, it will only show the perilandic yeah. or only posterior involvement. Yeah. It is not yeah, like it's that. It's a spectrum. Yeah, we have so. seen cases with the uh, anterior involvement as well. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. I've seen on the MRI clearly, maybe the pet demonstrates over here. So, yeah. All right, uh, hopefully you'll come back with the result on the Yes, sure. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Anas, what are you? Nine-year-old uh, right? He had back, he's uh, born to consanguineous uh, parents, uh, sixth in birth order. He had a uh, baseline mild development delay. He attained supported walking by one and a half years of age. Um, and could he attains, uh, he could speak few words. That is baseline, and then later, uh, before the prior to the premorbid, uh, premorbidly he could go up and down the stairs independently. So he had seizures from uh, four years of age, right focal, uh, which were controlled. So what happened two months earlier? Uh, they, so they are from uh, Somalia, uh, not from here. So two months uh, back, uh, child had uh, left focal seizures. Post the seizure, he had weakness, uh, which is uh, gradually uh, improving over the past two months, but it's still there. Uh, since then, his speech output has reduced. Uh, this behavioral issues in the form of aggression uh, and excessive laughing, smiling behavior. His sleep is disturbed. Uh, he is not able to recognize parents. Uh, he is dependent um, uh, on the parents for activities of daily living. So an examination, his circumference was 53 centimeters. He was smiling all the time and appropriately. Uh, there was, uh, in the left upper and lower limb, there was spasticity, uh, pyramidal sign, the form of spasticity and brisk reflexes and extensive plantar. Okay, uh, MRI, I think done recently, no? or what, what was the timeline? Huh? Uh, yes, sir, the MRI was done recently. Sir. It's an external scan, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. So MRI, we can appreciate, again, uh, global reduction in volume predominantly in the cortical regions, um, supratentorial and infratentorially. Uh, there were some subcortical particle uh, hyperintense changes, see over here in the right frontal lobe, the temporal lobe out here, um, especially on the D2A sequences, uh, better appreciate on the flare sequences on bottom. The subcortical cortical hyperintense changes leaving the frontal lobe, the bilateral temporal lobe out here, as you see in the last image over here, right temporal lobe slightly more than the left, but bilateral temporal lobe abnormalities, uh, the basal ganglia, possibly the putamen slightly reduced in volume, um, periventricular, um, some hyperintensities, but not significant, some degree of mild lateral ventricle given that there's overall reduction in the volume of the brain parenchyma. I could not appreciate any structural abnormalities, uh, malformations. Uh, related changes. On the diffusion weighted sequences, 
uh, there was some degree of uh, high signal changes in the frontal cortex, uh, the anterior basal ganglia on the DWS sequences, if you see on the temporal lobe, the right side more than the left. Uh, but the corresponding ADC is, uh, does not truly restrict or show low signal changes. Possibly some degree of um, T2 shading out here. Um, the frontal regions, um, if you see the cortex is slightly low in signal. So some degree of frontal abnormalities out here, the chordates are slightly, slightly high point lens. Um, so mixed pattern uh, of uh, edematous changes, um, especially in the cortex and the anterior basal ganglia, uh, with a with a background of uh, volume loss in the supra and infratangular brain. I was as image, midline image, uh, again demonstrating the atrophic changes in the corpus callosum, the vermis, um, and the supratangular structures. Uh, given that uh, these abnormalities, we're thinking of uh, imaging wise, the thought of possibility of autoimmune encephalitis uh, was one of, one of the considerations. Uh, the other possibility I thought was uh, SSP. I'm not sure if it clinically corroborates um, the later stage of SSP. Uh, any chronic uh, viral encephalitis uh, related conditions. And there was a question of uh, mitochondrial disorder uh, as a possibility. Uh, imaging wise, I could not put it into a uh, phenotype for a mitochondrial disorder. Uh, not ruled out, but I couldn't uh, suggest a possible complex or subtype for a mitochondrial disorder. HLH was another consideration, um, especially given the blast panel over here, atrophy with subparticle particle changes. Um, on the imaging wise, these are the differentials which we thought of. Um, and the investigations, uh, Anas, yeah. So, so we have sent uh, autoimmune uh, panel and the measles antibodies. Though he did not, I mean, he did have history of fever with rash, uh, but it was very non-specific, and we could not come to any conclusion. He didn't have any clinically. He didn't have any myoglobulins or any head drops. Uh, but yeah, he was sweating. I mean, there was some background history of development delay. Uh, that is why clinically we're thinking of mitochondrial. But um, I think oh, I mean, we... stroke-like episodes, like Mela's type phenotype. Uh, not earlier. So this is the first time he had this weakness. So. Right. So autoimmune and measles uh, to be awaited, but clinically thinking of possibility of mitochondria. Yeah, yes, sir. And radiologic, I mean, clinically autoimmune as well, uh, in the background of some development delay. The only question was autoimmune was a little long standing, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, yes. It was the only thing which was against autoimmune. Yes, sir. Yes. And no behavioral changes till now. Uh, behavioral changes are there, sir, like in the form of like the encephalopathy, this smiling behavior. There's definitely a change in his base. Uh, uh, behavior compared to the baseline. All right, I'll open the case for any further questions, comments. Here, yeah, the cerebellum is also showing a little sure. atrophy, Come, and the previous cases also had the cerebellar atrophy. Yes. Another thing we can uh, look, uh, uh, fail to uh, mention previously the two cases of Paul G, the inferior olivary nucleus, we have to specifically see whether any HOD is there or not. Because palsy disorders can show hypertrophic olivary degeneration like it's uh, EEG, Anas, the question of EEG. EEG had uh, just uh, background slowing. There was no uh, retromacal complexes uh, for SSP. So, Dr. Vijay, mitochondria is still a possibility? Um, in this case, I don't know whether mitochondria is the first yeah. possibility. But uh, uh, obviously, it's one of the possibilities. More, I think I I will think of a more of an autoimmune encephalitic process in this case. Because the temporal involvement, it is more diffuse. Mm. It's not like melas or anything. Yeah, that's what I feel. The cortex, I mean, the thickness is not not lyotic type abnormality like melas, the chronic sequelae. Only worry is that the cerebrum and cerebellum is showing significant volume loss. Yeah. Whether that is pointing to something like, uh, especially the cerebellar volume loss. Mm -hmm. Spectroscopy is not there here also, I suppose. No, yeah, it's external scan, I think not. Mm -hmm. No, no spectroscopy. We have some genetics and as well as autoimmune panel. Um, I think we'll be getting it in now. So imaging wise, at least we are thinking autoimmune first. Okay. Then maybe mitochondrial a second possibility. If you're clinically mm -hmm. suspected. Mm -hmm. You see, there is a microcephaly, I think, trial as 
मोमोस है फिर मैं आई यार दिया ये डंडा पे माइक्रो से मॉग आई थिंक अगेन मॉग इज अ क्वेश्चन वाज इट अ वी वर नॉट थिंकिंग इन टर्म्स ऑफ मॉग बेस्ड ऑन द सब एक्यूट टू HIV is negative. It is HIV, it is B, it is it is B S A G, it is C B negative. All right. Um, I think that's it. No further comments or suggestions. So get back to us with your answer. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. All right, I think that's our last case. Uh, Priya is in there. Uh, we'll discuss this case on the next uh, session. Uh, Nikhail, any follow up for the previous cases? In any, uh, I think one follow up was there. Arti, if you're there, if you just can tell us. Uh, uh, the back, the one with the multiple enhancing lesions, if you remember, uh, uh, we had multiple scans. Um, yeah. Um, fungal was stop eighty two. Okay, yeah, fungal, yeah. But it was yes, that uh, today evening the scan was done. They are stopping antibiotics. Um, Anas, is that right? Um, this is the patient. Uh, I don't want to give out the name, but yeah, it's doing quite well. Clinically. Check is there, yeah. No, no, we we've just uh, changed the anti just reduced one antibody, continuing on ciftriaxone and added oral uh, linezolid. So the two more weeks. Uh, yeah, look, come in. Just I maybe mean, slightly reduce our yeah. Performance. So. Just following the trajectory of the bacterial etiology, I guess. Likely, likely, very likely bacterial. Okay. Yeah, there was one more from uh, Kim's, but uh, they haven't sent the emails. Maybe I'll pull it up next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, we'll meet again in the next year. So, uh, thank you, happy everyone. Happy New Year. I wish you all a happy New Year. Absolutely.